On Christmas Eve 1971, 94 passengers boarded the Lancer Flight 508 departing from Lima, Peru and scheduled to land in Pacalpa in just over an hour. Everyone was excited, they were returning home for Christmas and their families would spend the day expecting to see their loved ones finally come home. The passengers of Flight 508 filed down the aisles and packed away their luggage containing mostly Christmas gifts intended for the next day. After sitting down, the flight would take off and 20 minutes later they would be served breakfast. While some were eating, others by the window would notice the plane slowly being swallowed by darkness. From the black box recording, the pilots would be heard talking about Christmas and their children seemingly just as oblivious to the storm as most of their passengers. But if they didn't notice the sky change colour, they would feel it when the plane started to shake violently. As the plane shook, people would begin to scream and luggage would tumble out of the overhead compartments littering the aisles. This is when 17-year-old Juliana Kopke would look over at her mother, someone who was nervous about flying after a plane she had been on previously suffered from engine failure. Juliana's mother tries to keep her composure and says to her daughter, hopefully this goes alright, but Juliana can hear the nervous tone in her mother's voice. No sooner than the words left her mother's lips, a blinding white light would strike the right wing of the plane. Shaken in her seat and blinded by the light, Juliana can't tell whether it was a lightning strike or an explosion that caused the flash. The cries of the passengers grow louder as the plane's turbines begin to fail. The plane jolts downward. Juliana's heart is now beating out of her chest and all sense of time has gone out of the window. She then turns to her mother, who is eerily calm when she tells her daughter, now it's all over. During this strange limbo in time where everything is happening at such a rapid pace but also moving so slowly, Juliana has no time to comprehend what her mother is saying before the plane begins nosediving. Her sense of time returns to her in a blink of an eye. The screaming is now gone, replaced by the roaring plane engines and her mother has been ripped out of her seat. Juliana, still strapped to the three-seat row, is no longer inside the plane. She is now free-falling from 10,000 feet alone and terrified. The roar of the engine is replaced by the torrent of air filling her eardrums. The seatbelt pushes into her stomach so tightly she can barely breathe and soon she falls out of consciousness. When she comes to, Juliana finds herself now upside down hurtling towards the green treetops of the Peruvian jungle. Juliana blacks out once again and when she comes to, she is now under the plane seat and on the jungle floor. The three seat row had acted as a makeshift parachute and shield both slowing her fall and protecting her from the impact. For the rest of the day and night, she lies there in an almost comatose state. The next morning, now Christmas Day, she opens her eyes, covered in mud and dirt from the jungle floor. The reality of the situation begins to set in. Her left eye is completely swollen shut and her right eye only offers a narrow slit of vision. However, this offers little comfort. Her glasses were lost in the fall and what sight she has in her right eye is blurred. Thoughts of her now missing mother come to her and bring a feeling of pure loneliness. Checking her watch, she can make out it's 9am. The sun is shining, but she doesn't have the energy to move. After blacking out multiple times, Juliana is finally able to get to her knees. She can feel her collarbone is broken, but the thought of her mother takes over. Crawling on all fours, she tries searching for her. The two had been sitting right next to each other, so she hoped that her mother would be close by. But despite her calls, the silent and empty jungle offered little reassurance that her mother was still alive. Not only is she now alone in the Peruvian jungle, but she's wearing a mini dress, only has one sandal, and is without her glasses. With blurred vision, she decides to keep the sandal on her foot to lead her steps as she feels her way around the floor of the jungle. While searching the area, overwhelming thirst would suddenly hit her, and the only option would be to lick droplets off the leaves that she could find. But soon her luck would change when she hears the faint sound of water dripping in the distance. Eventually she would come by a small stream, something that would fill her with hope. Not only was it a source of fresh water, but she remembers her father telling her that a stream would always lead to people. Her parents' knowledge is the one thing she had to her advantage. They were both zoologists and had taken Juliana with them into the same jungle she was now trapped in. Taking her father's advice, Juliana would continue along the stream for hours and it would slowly expand into a river. With day turning to night and exhaustion setting in, Juliana would eventually be forced to find a spot to rest. Most likely because of her concussed state, she would enjoy a deep sleep on the first night. But as the days went on, without fire and stranded in the cold, she would be plagued by mosquitoes and other insects. 
some of which would crawl into her ears and nose as she slept. The next day on December 26, Juliana continued following the stream, passing a bird-eating spider and traversing the tree trunks littering the area despite her injuries. The more ground she covered, the wider the river became, and soon she would hear something even more promising. Search planes were flying right above her, the only problem being the thick canopies above made her all but invisible from the sky. But these planes would continue to circle above as they searched for survivors, and all Juliana could do was follow the stream in hopes that it would lead her to an open area where they could see her. While trekking through the jungle with these planes overhead, her thoughts would fall on her mother, wondering if they would find her amongst the survivors. On the fourth day, still in the jungle, still invisible to the planes above, she would hear another familiar sound. She would hear the sound of a group of king vultures, Something her parents had taught her meant only one thing. Juliana followed the noise off the river track she had been following and found a gruesome reminder of just how lucky she had been. In front of her was a row of seaplanes, identical to Juliana's, but this one had collided head first with the jungle floor. The corpses of two women and a man lay head down, their feet twisted and sticking up toward the sky. The vultures above were yet to descend on the bodies. What they were waiting for, she wasn't sure. Scanning the area for other survivors, she would only find a few pieces of scrap metal before the sound of another plane flying overhead interrupted the search. She understood she needed to keep moving if she wanted to be rescued, and if she didn't, her fate might end with the vultures as well. The next few days would pass with Juliana following the stream, traversing logs and thick bushes on its path, suffering cuts and scrapes. For the days that she spent in the jungle, all she had on her was a few small pieces of candy. Her knowledge of the jungle only helped her to realize almost all the vegetation within reach was poisonous. After six days, Juliana would finally make it to a spot where the jungle wasn't overshadowing her with its tall trees, but by this time, the rumble of the plains looking for survivors was so far in the distance, there was no chance they would see her. First anger grips Juliana, and then despair, as a wave of overwhelming loneliness hits her. The sides of the riverbank she has been following have become too overgrown to traverse, but the water is her only true hope of rescue. Juliana makes the decision to continue down the riverbed by walking and swimming through it. Aware of the dangers, Juliana knows if the river is shallow, there's the danger of stingrays. If it's deeper, then there are certainly piranhas and caiman alligators. Even if she didn't encounter any of these creatures, it's the bugs that really torment her. Mosquitoes, midges, and gnats are constant, buzzing around her and biting her. Attempts to sleep are no longer easy either. Her concussion has faded, and now she is aware of the bugs in the night that plague her. The only break she gets from the bugs is when the rain comes, but that too brings its own set of torment. Ice cold rain and wind chills her bones. The leaves she gathers do little to protect her, and the pitch black darkness of the jungle leaves her feeling incredibly vulnerable. Rest is scarce. The jungle has a hold of her, and with these torments, when she has nothing to do, Juliana just lays there and thinks of her mother, wondering if she's out there too. Things start to get even worse for Juliana when she begins to feel a strange sensation in her upper right arm. Twisting her head to inspect it, she sees white things moving around inside a wound, feasting on her flesh. Flies had laid their eggs in her wounds, which had now turned to squirming and hungry maggots half inch in size. Bending the ring she had on her finger, Juliana creates a makeshift set of tweezers, hoping to pull them out, but the moment she attempts to pull them out, they crawl further inside her wound and disappear. Though these maggots are likely to avoid hurting their host in order to continue feeding, the idea of them crawling inside her, eating away at her flesh, makes her feel sick. But there's nothing she can do about them. The only option she has is to keep swimming down the stream in the hopes she'll find rescue. Whether it's day 7 or day 8, by this time Juliana isn't sure, but her body is becoming weaker with each passing day. While swimming down the river, she comes into contact with martens and brocket deer. Both animals generally fear humans, but these ones don't flee in her presence. The knowledge her parents have passed on to her is both a blessing and a curse, because she understands why they aren't bothered by her. These animals haven't come across enough humans to fear them yet, which meant she was still miles away from any other person. The following days are spent swimming and floating down the river, the sun beating down on her bare flesh causing second degree burns across her back. At one point, she would come across a number of baby caimans close by their mother. 
Raising its legs, the mother would threaten Juliana, who had jumped out of the river after seeing them, but without option, she would continue on down the river once the threat had passed. Thoughts of eating the frogs she came across would occur to her as well, however, she knew most of them were poisonous, but the intense hunger wouldn't stop her from weighing up the risk. Filling her stomach with one wouldn't kill her, but it would make her sick. So on several occasions, she would try to catch one of these frogs, but in a weakened state, fail on each attempt. With starvation and exhaustion taking over, delirium would set in, causing her to mistake noises for those of chickens or treetops for the roofs of houses. Nearing the tenth night, Juliana would float to a gravel bank she intended to sleep on for the night, when she saw something. It looked like a boat, but she was sure it was just another one of the many hallucinations she'd had. But hallucination or not, she floats to it and reaches out. Her fingers grip the side and she realizes the boat is actually real. Leading from the gravel riverbed up a slope is a visible trail. Juliana staggers along it and a hut comes into view. Inside is a barrel of petrol and an outboard motor, but no one else. Remembering the maggots, growing fatter by the day and still feasting on her flesh, she struggles to take the screw cap off the barrel. Using the hose next to the barrel, Juliana siphons the petrol out onto her wound. Pain follows, the sting of petrol is bad, but the maggots, now trying to escape the petrol, first attempt to dig deeper into her flesh. Eventually, they come to the surface and Juliana painstakingly picks around 30 of them out of her wound. Attempting to sleep in the hut proves useless as the bark floor is too rough, so instead she finds a tarp, wraps herself in it, and sleeps on the riverbank as she had done most nights previously. In the morning, Juliana waits for someone to arrive, but by midday, no one returns to the hut, and she considers moving on, but not willing to take the boat and leave another stranded, she continues to wait. By the evening, she finally hears the sound of voices approaching. Three men come out of the tree line and visibly recoil at the sight of her. From their perspective, they would see a white blonde lady out in the deepest parts of the Peruvian jungle with dark red eyes. Unknown to Juliana, all of the blood vessels in her eyes had burst. Both of her eyes, including the iris, were blood red, giving them the appearance of having been gouged out of their sockets. Juliana would speak to them in Spanish and say, I'm a girl who was in the Lancer crash. My name is Juliana. It is from these men she would learn it had been 11 days since the crash, and in that time, no survivors or even the plane itself had been found. By January 13, 1972, 90 bodies had been recovered and 52 identified. It would be found that 14 others had survived the crash, just as Juliana had, but died in the jungle while awaiting rescue. 